What is up everyone? Welcome to another news video. It's been quite some time since I've done one of these, but I thought today was a good one to knock out relatively quickly because there's three things that I want to talk to, give you guys a quick summary on, and then maybe do a bit more of a deep dive in a later video. The first of which is going to be talking about HGA. Now, this is an announcement from them that indicates they've got a new ownership structure, which is um, a bit strange considering the new owners only came in, you know, I feel like maybe 12 months ago, maybe a little bit more than that. So you're essentially looking at now the third ownership structure in the last 18 months, and that is quite concerning for them as a business. Now, obviously, things haven't been going too well for them in general, but they've still had their fans, right? I really like them initially because I like the look of their slabs. I like their, you know, innovation when it came to the labels. I like the fact that they were trying to incorporate AI and all that sort of stuff. Even though it may have been a bit of smoke and mirrors, I really enjoyed what they were, you know, trying to do. And, you know, as I've talked to on this channel over the last two years, you know, as they became more and more progressed, right, they started to make more and more errors and just do really dumb things as a business. Um, so they've been on a steady decline, in my opinion, but I still think they have a place. You know, I want more competition, as much competition as possible. People clearly, you know, still like them. Um, but it's just interesting to see, you know, a new set of owners come in not long after the last ones took over. Now, what's interesting here is the people that have apparently, you know, bought it are the guys that were part of the AI software development that they use as part of their grading process, which is interesting. Um, it's good from a perspective that they seem to care about what it is they're doing, right? They built the AI to do this sort of thing. Is this going to be an interesting thing or a successful thing for them as a business? Who knows? I just thought it's a little bit, you know, concerning. And I did mention that in my story on Instagram today. One of the other things that I did mention as well is that if you read the press release, it, it reads incredibly amateur. It doesn't read very professionally in my opinion some of the wording used it just it just looks very poor in my opinion and i'm keen to hear what you guys have to say about that as well you know like i said they've been around for you know two or three years now they came in with this innovation came in with wanting to do things from a unique perspective for collectors and you know when the original ceo owner tyler was there they just made mistake after mistake he kept rushing and making stupid decisions and then would retract on those you know decisions within 12 to 24 hours, which, you know, when we talked about Beckett with their label change and all that sort of stuff, and then their grading scale change, you know, it's more alarming to make a rush decision and then backtrack than it is to make a rush decision and stand by your own, you know, statements and your beliefs, right? And the fact that HGA have done that consistently, they've made a decision and step back and retracted is just very poor form. That looks incredibly amateur and that's almost gone now you know, with the multiple owners that have come in as well. It's just showing that the business is maybe not on the right track, but I'm keen like I said, to hear what you guys have to say. And the next one is an interesting one. We talked to this, you know, a few months ago when, you know, it was first shared on Reddit. And that was the story about, you know, a, an apparent former employee from Backyard Breaks coming out and saying that there was deceptive practices, as you can see on screen, you know, with them as a business. And what that meant was that they apparently had a group of employees whose sole responsibility was to bid up items and whatnot, right? And if you're trying to sell spots, what these people were doing were, bidding up, bidding up, bidding up, and then basically forcing customers to pay more money, essentially shill bidding and committing fraud. What's interesting, if you haven't seen the recent Sports Card Radio live stream that's on screen right now, is that Sports Card Radio, Ryan in particular, who is on screen, mentioned that he had a conversation with, you know, a former employee. And based on that conversation, um, he is of the impression that, you know, that kind of thing was true and in fact did happen. He's not sure if it still happens, but it allegedly happened, you know, months ago, maybe a year ago. I can't remember the exact timeline. And that was one of the big detractors when that Reddit post was first made about this person coming out and saying, I'm a former employee. This is what they told me to do. You know, people didn't really believe it, right? Because it was just a, you know, unverified post on Reddit. But according to Ryan, he's had a conversation and has since, you know, confirmed that with, you know, a former employee. And the concerning piece was that it wasn't just shill bidding up auctions or maybe rigging some of these raffles and things like that. What they were also doing is, um, you know, the freebies they were handing out, they weren't actually free to begin with. Now, one of the big, you know, pillars of support from for Backyard Breaks when all those hot box talk came out was that they look after their customers really well and they're giving them, you know, free cards if they don't hit anything good. What this, you know, Reddit thread essentially alluded to was that those free cards that you're getting weren't actually from the person's personal collection, as is mentioned in the live streams. What this person alleges is that there's a stack of cards off camera that they hand out for free when people, you know, have a bad break in order to suck them in and make them feel a little bit better. 
But the, the dodgy element of that is not just the fact they've lied that those cards are coming from their PC, it's the fact that the value of those cards has already been priced into the break that people are buying into as well. So they're not actually free according to what that Reddit post, you know, insinuated. Now, like I said, Ryan has confirmed this, so please, you know, check out, you know, this uh, this video. This live stream was quite good. Um, they mentioned a few others, Justin Gamble Gamble in there and a few others as well. But it's, it's just an interesting one. Now, if we take that, you know, former employee that Ryan spoke to, on face value and we treat it as being accurate that's incredibly shady business practices and it is you know it is fraud if you're intentionally bidding up without the intention to pay that is fraud and you know sooner or later these guys are going to get caught or somebody will get caught that does this and unfortunately for for them it's not just a slap on the wrist right if you're doing this as systematically as what it's being made out to be you know the mastro auction house and how him going to jail is a pretty clear indicator of how serious you know governments take this sort of stuff so if you're doing it, you basically need to stop because you are committing fraud. And um, if you don't really care about that, well, unfortunately, I've got news for you. Stuff's going to catch up to you eventually. So again, please share your thoughts on that down in the comments below. Now, the next thing I want to talk to is a pretty cool video that Simon466 Cards put out over the last few days. It, it's a two-part series, actually, that covers you know, the National Sports Convention and sort of how much money they were making and where that money is actually going. And he noticed a few things, so much so that I'm going to do a deep dive on this in the next week or so to share my thoughts because you guys do know that I am an accountant. So this is sort of like a bit of a wet dream for me, which is pretty sad to say, but it is interesting. Now, what Simon sort of noticed um, very quickly is that um, over the last you know few years, some interesting things happened with how they were you know, documenting some of their expenses within their IRS documents. And it looks slightly suspicious. It might be fine, but it looks slightly suspicious. Now, what they were doing previously with some of their expenses was categorizing them under management fees, management expenses. Now, there's no real clarity on what that actually meant, but you know, in 2015, 16, they changed the caption entirely. They stopped reporting under management and now started reporting under trade show expense, i.e. an even more vague you know, account caption. Now, what happened in the last two years is that that number grew astronomically. It was, you know, after the year of change in the caption, 800K, as you can see over here, and then, you know, in 2020, jumped up to 2 mil, and then last year jumped up to 3.2 million. And that is quite an alarming number. And it's something that I want to try and break down in the in the next you know few days. The reason why it's interesting is because that caption just looks like a catch-all, right? It doesn't really give much context. Now I will give some clarity. You know, it's pretty common, or I shouldn't say common, but it's not uncommon to see this from smaller not-for-profits like the national actually is, where they've got you know small finance teams, so they you know, just get lazy and they classify things into a bit of a dumping ground. But the thing that's very important with this, which is why it could be a bit of hanky-panky, is not-for-profits are essentially mandated by law to pay executives and pay employees within reason and not to pay them excessively. So the question then would become, well, if all of a sudden the national is making so much more money and, and we can jump over here for where he's looking at the profits, if they're making so much money all of a sudden, are they using this as a dumping ground to sort of line their own pockets? And you know, without being able to see the numbers behind these financials that they're submitting to the IRS, we won't really have an answer, but it's an interesting one to sort of look out for. And I'll jump into that in a bit more detail in my, you know, coming video on this, because it's one that needs to, to be talked. And I think some of you guys will find it interesting. You know, the other point that a few others have raised questions about is what you're sort of seeing from a profit perspective. You can see here in 2009, they barely made a profit. It really wasn't much happening year on year. They made a 220K profit in 15, 16, the year they changed that caption in the first place then made zero. He's asking the question around why that zero is there. Some small losses, 20K profit, and then, you know, this year pretty much making a, a 4K loss. Now, we'll say this, it's not uncommon to sort of see a zero dollar P&L for a not-for-profit because, you know, if you Google what a not-for-profit is meant, meant to be doing, it's meant to be spending, you know, their money to meet their obligations and meet the purpose of what they're trying to do as a business. So it's not uncommon for them to be in a position where they're looking like they're going to make profit, you know, come the end of the year but they then spend that money, you know, for the intentions of something in the coming year to further support the cause of that not-for-profit, right? So it's not uncommon to sort of see zero dollars there. And typically what you'll find if these businesses do in fact make a profit, it's not overly big and they'll just carry that forward into the next year, but it's for a very specific purpose, right? Not-for-profits are not there to hold profits year on year like a, you know, normally listed business would do via retained earnings and stuff like that. And that same thing goes for the fact that the, the loss is very, very small. So um, it could be perfectly legitimate. It's more than likely perfectly legitimate. The fact that these expenses completely match their revenue. The key question would then be what I just mentioned earlier. 
You can't be, you know, plugging your expenses to make no profit if you're doing it purely to pay yourself and pay yourself excessive salaries. That funding has to go for the purposes of that business. So I'm going to jump into this, like I said, in, in a more detailed you know, video to talk through it because I think Simon's video deserves a better shout out than what I just gave you guys. I want to jump through, you know, all the key points from what he's talked to, but I just think it's it's an interesting one and one to keep an eye on. There's been a lot of buzz in the last, you know, few hours based on people having sent me this and all that sort of stuff. But again, it is interesting. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's hanky panky going on because some of those things are not uncommon for not for profits to do. But let's dive into that in my next video. But in the meantime, please share your thoughts down below. Now, I think I shared everything I want to talk to on that one. Same thing with the other topics. Um, as always, if there's anything you want to chat to or share your thoughts on, please do it down below and I'll see you guys um, in the next video. Otherwise, cheers.